I'm not sure if I could trust them to navigate like four knockout games and win the trophy. I can't remember an England team being booed off, going into their families and sort of sitting down and looking very relaxed. I'd love to stick to football, uh, is my answer to that. That'd be great. Great if none of this was political. Hello and welcome to Indo World Cup. My name is Aidan O'Hara. Later we'll be joined by Daniel McDonnell, who had the pleasure of being at the great occasion that was Iran's 2-0 victory against Wales yesterday, and also at England and USA last night. We'll also look ahead to what's a big night for Argentina and Lionel Messi as they hope to cr- progress after a disappointing opening game. But the th- first, the theme of protest has been running through the first week of this tournament, and I'm joined by Kevin Byrne from the Irish Independent, who wrote a piece under the headline of we've seen courage and defiance with shed loads of hypocrisy um it's a very strong piece in Thursday's paper and online Kevin how are you first of all thanks for joining us yeah I'm good thanks very much for having me you're very welcome um the piece obviously was written in the day or the day of Germany's hand over the mouth protest such yeah. as that was what was your reaction to that when it came I mean it, it's better than not doing anything at all but I think it also kind of reframed the issue around Germany and the rest of the players being silenced rather than the actual thing that they were supposed to be protesting which was the treatment of LGBT people in Qatar so you know disappointed Uh, they very clearly designed the protest to once again ensure that they don't have to make any sort of actual real sacrifice they're still playing in the tournament uh, they avoided the the threat of yellow cards for one player, the peril. which was yeah, God forbid that one player picks up one yellow card. Uh, and Neuer's their captain, is he still? Yeah. So it would so. mean the goalkeeper picking up a yellow card, which mm-hmm. oh, how could they possibly go on with the goalkeeper on a yellow? Uh, so yeah, I mean, look, I think it was kind of self indulgent, uh, and again reframes the debate around the fact that they were silenced rather than. You know the thing they're meant to be protesting the focus is on how it's affecting them yeah yeah as opposed to people in in qatar who yeah. are the ones who are very much affected by this yeah and i mean like lgbt people all over the world uh are you know it's it's not great for us uh there was the shooting in colorado springs uh on sunday the kind of the early hours of sunday night uh sunday morning even where five people were killed depending on reports between 17 and 25 people were injured uh the gunman very specifically targeted a a queer bar um so you know it's it's not just a qatari issue it's mm-hmm. an issue kind of around the world uh, anecdotally from a few friends of mine you see it online all the time of there's kind of an increase in homophobia and transphobia going around and so to to shift the protest to we are being silenced was I mean, you can argue that we're being silenced about this was the protest, but but the kind of the chat is how brave those German players were for putting their hands over their mouths, lining up for a team photo, which let's be honest, that's not the part that people actually see. No. Uh, When you think of a football match, you're not really thinking of the part where everyone runs to the side for a team photo that the only reason you ever see them is because people are laughing at the Welsh lads doing it in a weird formation. So... Yeah, I mean, again, I think it's kind of a very bare minimum thing which involves a lot of back padding over. Look how great we are. We we stood up to them. We put our hands over our mouths. Didn't incur any sort of penalty. That was very important to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you heard Virgil van Dijk talking about how he couldn't possibly play any yellow card. And, you know, England were very adamant that Harry Kane couldn't pick up a yellow for their game against Iran. And thank God he didn't because otherwise, you know, that 6-2 scoreline might have been closer. Yeah. And sure, he's injured now anyway, so it's a good thing he didn't pick up that yellow. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Look, I, I know that there's going to be people listening to this who are annoyed at me, thinking, can you not just be grateful that they did something? But I think in all walks of life, but especially in men's sport, uh, LGBT people are told to accept the bare minimum or even less than the bare minimum. Mm-hmm. I think this is another example of that. Yeah, it was almost kind of answering a question that people weren't asking kind of thing by putting their hands over the mouth yeah. nobody was really saying that you were being silenced they had an issue with the fact that you weren't following through on the on your protest or on what the courage of your convictions almost yeah and i mean like look they they were being silenced to a degree by fifa but at the same time protest involves some kind of 
sacrifice mm-hmm. and loss if you truly believe in that you see the things that people pick up yellow cards for you know yeah. taking off protesting shirt. actually protesting about decision in fact sometimes. yeah protesting a decision with the ref that you know he's never going to change his mind on or taking too long over a goal kick because it's the 87th minute and you want to shed you know six more seconds mm-hmm. off the clock uh, or taking off your jersey to celebrate a goal which has been a yellow card for what 20 years mm-hmm. now so yeah I mean is that are those things worth more than the rights of you know five or ten percent of the population or however many of us are the LGBT community actually makes up uh-huh and you've a, a background in football reporting there what's you I know do, yeah. your, your, your background as well and what's your take then on the kind of stick to football side of things with, you know with with your report with your football reporting backgrounds h- how does that kind of you know marry into your um into your view or, or your current view around men's football and the tournament yeah i mean i'd love to stick to football mm-hmm. uh, is my answer to that that'd be great uh it'd be great if none of this was political it'd be great if football was somehow abstract from everything in life but it's not uh football clubs are political f- and even more so f- you know nations that represent states are inherently political mm-hmm. by definition uh, the decision to award qatar the world cup was a political one um having countries compete against each other on a national stage is an inherently political thing to do mm-hmm. you know you, FIFA doesn't allow you know Cork to send its own team it doesn't allow you to just decide this area that you're in it doesn't accept you know Catalonia mm-hmm. uh, it is a political thing you're representing political states so first of all it's an inherently political thing secondly football is a part of people's lives Um you know i would love to stick to football Mm -hmm. but that's not really how life works and particularly in the largest and most expensive sports washing event of all time uh i think saying to ignore politics and to keep politics out of it is at best naive Mm -hmm. and let's be honest i think a lot of the people who say this know that that's true yeah and just don't want to have to ever question their own conscience and say maybe this thing that i'm enjoying uncritically might have some bad aspects to it yeah yeah and football was a big part of your life from a from a working point of view for for quite a while yeah from a personal and a working point of view i mean i have been a football fan pretty much my whole life uh i started supporting arsenal back in the the mid 90s i ran through a few teams before that because i was four years old or whatever okay, yeah, it's you know, I, I I picked up teams along the way I liked Nottingham Forest because they had a player called Kevin Campbell I don't mm-hmm. know if you know this about me but my name's Kevin so that was my whole reasoning <laughs> but eventually landed on Arsenal my brother was an Arsenal fan my, my cousin my older cousin was an Arsenal fan so I stuck with them my dad's a Leeds fan he wasn't very happy about that uh, although his rule was so long as you don't support Man United you're fine yeah, I have a similar rule in my house so that's, yeah okay. but yeah I was a big Arsenal fan for, for many many years uh went over to Highbury for games, I went to the Emirates. I then pursued a career writing about football. I covered the Premier League uh, for two years uh, for a a website called football.london. I was the deputy editor of that website. You know, I was at Unai Emery's first press conference as Arsenal manager. I was at the FA Cup semi-final when Chelsea beat Spurs. And then I was at the final when Arsenal beat Chelsea Mm -hmm. that year. I was over in Milan to see Arsenal beat AC Milan in the San Siro, you know. I this is not something that I'm detached from. I'm mm-hmm. I've been a football fan for many, many, many years and over the last few years I've kind of found myself drifting away from the men's game of it. Uh the Super League was kind of the catalyst for that as I wrote in the piece. Mm-hmm. I had been kind of shifting away from it for a while anyway. Um when Arsenal played Chelsea in the Europa League final and Henrik Mikatarian couldn't play because yeah. again, a but, political decision mm-hmm. that the Armenian guy couldn't play in Azerbaijan. Uh, that was I'd been toying with the idea for a while of kind of drifting away from men's football just because a lot of the joy had been sucked out of it and I know people are going to listen to this and say yeah we were an Arsenal fan of course the joy was getting sucked out of it while Arsenal were bad but they're top of the league now and I've not been watching it Mm -hmm. this season I tell you what I have been watching is the Arsenal women's team Mm -hmm. big fan of that I've been watching the WSL for a few years now so 
you know, I still love football and I'm still trying to get my football fixed. Yeah. But I'm doing that in the women's game because I think that that aligns a lot more with, with my personal values. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, And when you see things like, you know, rainbow laces, one love armbands, yeah. all this kind of stuff, like, are they just empty gestures to you? Or, like, is it something that you're saying, okay, at least they're trying to raise awareness of, of an issue? Or is it just something that you think is ticking a box? Yeah, I mean, the Rainbow Laces campaign was started by a gambling company for publicity. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's not forget that. That's not something that anyone within the sport actually pushed themselves. It was only after that became popular that they adopted it. The One Love thing is an intentionally vague phrase that doesn't commit to anything mm-hmm. that was designed to be as inoffensive as possible to not get the slap in the wrist from FIFA. And then the second that it actually got a bit of bite and FIFA kicked up about yeah. it, they dropped it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's very hard to see that happening and not think that these are just token gestures that when push comes to shove, they're going to just turn their backs in the LGBT com- community because that's mm-hmm. what they've done. And you see it with the women's football. You see Katie McCabe has spoken out about it. Mm-hmm. Um, Leah Williamson spoke out about it recently. Megan Rapino, like, there's so much more integrity. And in they speak with a directness as well. But yeah, they actually go straight to the that's issue. That's the not, thing. Not a, not a vague. They're not dancing around it. They're not doing vague platitudes of, you know, I'm just here to play football or, mm-hmm. uh, look, people should be allowed to love who they love. They're saying this is this is ridiculous. Like, I'm not going to support this. I'm not going to watch it. Yeah. We have professional athletes who, you know, Katie McCabe, Captain Ireland to our first World Cup mm-hmm. and she's saying she's not watching the World Cup, the, the Men's World Cup this year. So, you know, I, look, I'm not going to have a go at anyone for, for watching the Men's World Cup this year, but like, you know, you can't pretend it's squeaky clean. No, no. I, I think, like for me, as a heterosexual male, I, you, the bit I find hard to get my head around is the idea in Qatar that, like most all countries have laws and that, you know, if you hit someone in the face or you deal drugs or any of those sort of things, you can be picked up and arrested for something that you do, some crime you commit. Whereas in, this is also true in Qatar, but in the issue around the LGBTQ uh, is that you can be arrested and criminalized for something that you are. I mean, the phrase we were speaking earlier on, a phrase you use, it criminalizes your identity. Yeah. Like it's, it's very, very difficult living here in Ireland to kind of have that idea that you can be arrested for doing something that is normal here, but, you know, is, is a crime elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, look, I, uh, that was illegal in Ireland in our lifetimes as well. Uh, it was things 93 it was homosexuality was decriminalized in Ireland um, it is ridiculous you know it's and and I, I did say this to you before off, on, off mm-hmm. air but I do think it is one thing that annoys me about the debate is that it's always framed around you should be allowed to love who you love but you know straight people don't have to love someone to be in a relationship with them mm-hmm. to be publicly in a relationship I don't want to have to say I'm in love with this person to be allowed to do normal things like holding their hand in public um yeah i mean i think growing up i'm bisexual and any time that i've been in a relationship with a man and being on dates with men and stuff like that you're hyper aware in a way that i'm not when i go on dates with women and Mm -hmm. if i'm in a relationship with a woman like it is there is kind of a self-policing thing to it because you know that there are people out there who see you and are unhappy with you purely because of the fact that you are attracted to people who are the same gender as you. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's nonsense. And look, it that way of thinking will never make sense to me. So I can't really give you an answer on that. Mm-hmm. But it is, and these laws are designed so that it's not illegal to be gay. It's illegal to do things that are gay. Uh, yeah. So they are criminalizing the act. And if you're gay, that's fine. You're just never allowed to act on that. Yeah like it's ridiculous you know it's like saying it's 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 legal to have clean teeth you're just not allowed to brush them yeah like it's it's stupid stuff and it's backwards and yeah it just it breaks my heart because i know as well that uh the people the queer community of qatar are going to get this way worse because the world cup is going to leave 
everyone's going to forget about it and six months down the line there's still going to be gay people and bisexual people and trans people in Qatar who you know every, people there who have been on their best behaviour while the world is watching mm-hmm. now are going to release a bunch of this pent up anger that they have for no reason towards these people so I worry about what's going to happen when the World Cup leaves because I don't think they're going to be as stupid as to do a big crackdown while the world is watching yeah. but what are they going to do six months a year from now yeah. as a retaliation for not being allowed to do that stuff during the World Cup that's what I worry about yeah have you been watching the tournament? Uh, do you think you will watch the rest of the tournament? Uh, no, I haven't watched any of it. Uh, I mean, it's it's impossible to ignore that it's happening. And I worked in the industry for, for long enough that I have a lot of friends who, you know, are reporting on it and things like that. So I see bits on Twitter and things pop up, but I've not sat down and watched a game and I don't plan to. Okay. Kevin, that's been great. Um, thanks thanks very, very much for your insight. And again, I recommend the piece under the headline. We've seen courage and defiance which shed loads of hypocrisy it's on independent.ie if you want to catch up with it that was Kevin Byrne and after the break we'll be joined by Daniel McDonnell thanks very much cheers so let's get over to Qatar and join Dan uh, you had a busy day with Wales and England in the one day yeah I think if you'd said to me at the start of the day or I think the, the general assumption people might have naturally reached from afar is you've got Wales v Iran and you've got England v USA I think the natural instinct would be to maybe look forward to England v USA more um, and it was the game that was the closest to sold out game um, that I've attended so far in the tournament very few free seats there uh, even in the sort of the, the premium areas but um, I mean Wales Iran is one of the best football events I think I've possibly been at um, and England USA, one I'll probably forget I was at it next week. Um, a slight contrast. I mean, the the Wales Iran occasion was powerful, and I suppose probably had a sense it was going to be that way. Even just with some of the chat around Iran this week, some of the coverage, some of the stories coming out. Naturally, the the the, the players' refusal to sing the anthem on Monday, you knew it was going to be highly charged, but. There probably is just a, a contrast from reading about yeah. it and even watching it to experiencing it. And um, just that, like the, the, the booze during the anthem, the big screen flashing to the Iranian fan in tears, and just the general energy in the stadium that was created. Like, um, And sometimes you can get caught up in the moment and, and lose a little bit of perspective. And you're very conscious of that. Like, you know, the, the best thing you've ever been at is the thing you were just at. Um, and you can all sort of fall into that trap. But there was a real That's not the case. That's the thing, of okay. What you've just been at was England and USA. What you've no, just no, been one at was England and USA. Out. So Terry, yeah. could, Terry would be saying that, yeah. yeah. One, of the, one of the worst things I've Sorry, was Sorry, it was around. a sense but, of occasion. Uh, I do. Ah, like, I mean, it, it really was just in... Um, and, and just the nature of the game. Like, there, there was a real sense of, like, sometimes the that dreaded word, the narrative, you know, but like sometimes there's a sense that the, the game fits in with it, where it was like, for, for the Iranian players, you could see they probably got a lot of grief from different sides for, for things that happened this week. You know, as their players were saying after, they were feeling the pressure, you know, they sang during the anthem, but sang half-heartedly. And you could, you know, people could see that on the screen, you know, it was like that they weren't really fully committed, but they were doing it. One of their ex-teammates had been arrested on Thursday. Yeah. Um, and all this is going on. So then you go into the game and you're thinking, right, can this be the big distraction for them? Can it be the release? And yet it was being, it was becoming this tale of woe. It was like a hard luck story playing out in front of you in real time. It was like the story we've seen before, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to do this, are they? Like in a strange way, I, I even think back to like the Ireland game in Paris where like they, they, they went at it, but, but you just knew that the missed chances would catch up with them, except in this case, they didn't. They actually went and did it, and um, yeah, the post-match scenes, the you know the Qatari security had been confiscating flags and and um, various things beforehand, struggling to like contain fans who were like clambering over to try and like get photos or get messages to players. That you know there was um there was fans like throwing their phone onto the pitch, and the Iranian players were picking them up, taking a selfie with you know them in the foreground and the fans in the background and throwing the phones back and um, 
it was real uh, sort of unbridled emotion as, as I wrote. Like, it was the real thing. And that's the point for me. Like, you know, you're, you're still walking around here with a suspicious eye to a lot of stuff. There's more stories about fans being paid and rehearsed chants and all of that. But there was nothing manufactured about the atmosphere around this game. It was a real World Cup moment. And I loved it. And I mean, I've, I've said all of that without mentioning Wales, the team closest to us, um, because they were almost a bit part players in, in the whole day. I, I wrote that they were supporting actors. I think that was too strong. They were more like extras um, yeah. in, in terms of the what was basically an Iranian story. Yeah, I think Bale and Ramsey, the players that you looked to, were certainly extras even within the Wales team. But, I mean, you said yesterday, with I think it was in, in relation to Wales scoring, that if the game is boring, you have 10 minutes to go that, you know, to make sure to stay tuned. I mean, it, it wasn't boring, but the action in the last 10 minutes, it, it, there must have been some noise in the stadium wherever that goal went in. Well, listen, I did predict that Wales would execute a strike after the 80th minute, and they did. It just so happened it was their goalkeeper, Kung Fu, kicking yeah. an opposition striker. Um, so, I mean, they did they did make their mark in that period. Um, and again, even it was one of those where, like, okay, is the team with 10 men going to escape? But they couldn't do that because Wales probably knew they needed to win. Um, even yeah. though the way things have panned out, like you, maybe the group would have a different complexion if, if if it had finished in a draw, even for Wales. Whereas now, um, they're they're pretty much done. Um, yeah. But actually, they're not, it, it well, they, they need to win and they need Iran to draw. Like you know, the, for Iran, the fact that this is separated on goal difference rather than head to head, so it means that yeah. Iran losing by four goals means they can't really have a tie. As much as they got to even that late winner maybe could be significant in some way. Or sorry, not the mm-hmm. late winner, the, the second goal. Um, no. But but the way things are set up, um, like it still looks like England will go through and, and still most likely as group winners, barring an unlikely yeah. series of results. And you mentioned the idea of fans being paid to be there. If there were England fans being paid to be there, they were certainly authentic in the timing of the boos last <laughs> night after that performance. Like a FIFA boo or something, like one of the computer game boos. I, I'm not sure if I was expecting it. Like, I mean, there was an English majority in the crowd, and you could sense the frustration building around the place, but not in a really uh, aggressive way. I don't know. It was just a bit of an outpouring at full time. Uh, I couldn't believe how bad they were, really. Like, I, I definitely, I think sometimes in Ireland, like, we're, we're probably programmed to be skeptical of, of English hype, yet. I, I don't know, I can't speak for everyone, but there was this feeling of a, maybe a little bit of substance to this belief yeah. um, this time. And, uh, man, I, 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 you know, I was trying to write a piece on it. Um, you know, at the end of a long day, you don't always articulate your views in the way you would like. But I think the thing about England is that they give teams a chance, you know. Like, they have this ability to, like, you, as much as they got to the Euros final, even within some of the games along the way, like the Denmark game and stuff, there's always a, a period where they, uh, as much as they talk about Southgate's conservatism, like they, they let other teams into the game. Maybe that they allow them to grow in confidence because they can be quite passive sometimes. And uh, I just don't know. Like I, I, I just think I'm not sure if I can trust them to navigate like four knockout knockout games and win the trophy. I feel yeah. like they're just they, they'll 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 throw in a bad half and get punished by a, a better side. There was an interesting thing I thought at the end, and I'm not sure if it was picked up on TV, but the the players were all in with their families after the after full time, and you know obviously there's nothing nothing wrong with that, but it's the sort of thing that I can't remember an England team being booed off by certain sections of their fans going into their families and sort of sitting down and looking very relaxed, and that's so it kind of gives the impression that they're they're happy enough with where they stand, and you know beating Wales, go through as group winners, and you know off to go. Yeah, well, I mean, that is a big thing of theirs, like the, the, the stuff with the families after, and, and they sell it as something different. It's part of the, the Southgate thing. Like I, I was talking to a few of the English press lads who are just covering England only, um, just asking them what it's like out there, and, and they are just saying it's, it's a different vibe compared to um, the, the old days where there would be tension. Like, it is genuinely quite relaxed. And I think, actually, like one of the more interesting things about England now is that well, we often would speak about England in the context of, say, press relations, like the Graham Taylor years, where it's like the press on their back. Um, now it's it's not quite that, you know. It, it feels like there's a better vibe even around the press pack and the English team, that the criticism mm-hmm. is quite measured. So as a result, they don't have to build that sort of siege mentality that might have existed previously. And they're all a lot more mature about it. And maybe 
you know, did people are drawing parallels with the Scotland game and the Euros where they were poor and then they bounced back from it. But I just don't know, like, um, you can, there's always danger of reacting too much. Like, I don't know what you think, but you'd be thinking uh, England has poten- potential winners there because I think you were in a sort of confident enough position. I was, uh, I was. I, position. I, I think you kind of, I think they'll stumble across something maybe perhaps in the next game with Wales, potentially with Fold. And then, you know, you go on to, you know, by the looks of it, you know, you'd have to expect them to be playing either, you know, Ecuador or um, or Senegal. Senegal. Yeah. Senegal or Ecuador. So, you know, again, you'd expect them to come through that last 16 game. This might be tricky, but, you know, they might edge their way through again. I think they will stumble across a, stumble across a formula and be able to get themselves potentially into quarterfinal. And who knows after that? Though tonight now we have a look ahead to, to tonight with Argentina and Mexico. It's sort of a day or two halves. We start with Tunisia, Australia, Poland, Saudi Arabia, and then into France, Denmark, and Argentina, and Mexico. Messi has been reported as saying that the World Cup starts now for them, and it kind of it had better start now or else it'll be over for them. Yeah, that'll be an intense game. I, I'm actually at France, Denmark, but um, for reasons stated previously, I just don't want the rejection of being knocked back from an Argentina game. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, although I am down to their last one, but yeah, like it's, it's, um, I mean, they have to respond, you know. And I, I mentioned, I think, one of the other pods that I think they took a little bit of heart from Poland and Mexico game the way it panned out. And it was sort of an uninspiring game. And Argentina still no deep down, they do have their fate in their own hands. Uh, you know, not some other teams aren't 100% in that position. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I sort of I think they'll win, but I don't really have a great like. Uh, analysis based reason to, to sort of back that up or that I'm just believing that uh, they, 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 they won't they, they'll be fully plugged into the enormity of this and they'll respond to it positively and mm-hmm. um, beyond that um, you know, I, I can see why it could be a very nervous for one for them if there's like 60 minutes in and it's still level and then you're sort of into yeah. the realms of where do we stand here um, yeah yeah, we have it. We might as well go into predictions from there. So yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll start. We'll start at the end, if you like. Argentina, Mexico. How how do you see that going? I mean, I think it's going to be a fiery one as well. Like I think it'll be physical. I know it's a bit, you're reverting to sort of national stereotypes a bit in some way. It's always a tendency in international football, but you can just see this game being a derby in some ways, you know, and having that real aggression and energy to it. Um, Maybe Argentina can just about rise above it and, and, and win by a single goal, 1-0. But I'm not, like, overwhelmed with confidence, as I said. Yeah, you? I'm going to go for a 3-2. I'm going to go for a 3-2 win for Argentina. Just oh, man. Saturday night, I did. had a really, really good day of predictions yesterday, so uh, hopefully keep it going. So uh, we'll have France and Denmark next, the game that you're going to be at. I think, I, I think Denmark have beaten them twice this year, so I can see France just... I think I'm going to go for one all in this one. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I this this is a game. Yeah, where I don't know. I, I like Denmark have beaten them twice, as you've said, and they've got their number. And and France, to me, while they were sensational in flashes against Australia, I didn't think they were like all that good. You know, you, the tendency to like to look at the scoreboard and say, yeah, they turned it on. But I think Australia are pretty weak, to be honest. Um, so. Yeah, I, I, I mean, are we allowed to give the same score? I mean, should we go differently? Absolutely, yeah. should. no, absolutely. Right. We go we'll the go same score. I'm going to go one all. I, I'm going to go, gonna go for an, an Irish style one all. Yeah. So get your money on draw, no bet. Then if you're go, if you're going with yeah, them. Uh, we'll take the last two two together and with Tunisia, Australia to start, and then Poland and Saudi Arabia. Oh God, um, pick your numbers. I'll go for Tunisia to win one nil, and I'll go for. I kind of wonder could it be hard for Saudi to live up to that high? I kind of could it be a two-one for Poland. Yeah, I was going to go two-nil Poland, and I'll go I'll go two-nil Tunisia. I have one-nil written down beside me, but you can't be we can't both be the same on that. Um, we'll we leave it at that, Dan. You've had a long day, so we'll we we we'll leave it at that. <laughs> we we'll leave it at that for today. Um, we will come back again tomorrow, where hopefully Messi's still in the competition, and uh, we'll have some insight from France and Denmark from you tomorrow. So. Thanks for, thanks for listening and we'll be speak to you again tomorrow.